Dr. Plokey, thank you very much. I now, uh, I have already introduced Ambassador Volker to our audience, but I want to welcome Kurt uh, to the stage. As I said, uh, we heard from Dr. Plokey the historical context for our conversation today. We're going to turn to Ambassador Volker to offer a perspective on now and the way forward on how to champion the front lines of freedom erasing the gray zone. Uh, and as I said, this is a, a remarkable friend and colleague who brings an extraordinary mind to the challenges of Europe's East. Ambassador yeah. Volker. Well, thank you, Damon, and it is an honor to be here. Um, can I get out from behind the podium? Is that possible? Great. Good. We can do that. So thank you very much. And I am delighted to be. Is that the idea? Great. Thank you. All right. High Tech Atlanta Council. Thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to offer a couple of thoughts uh, to get a discussion going. I think we're going to do a Q&A after that, right? So that's the idea. Uh, so I, I thought the, uh, the best framework for talking about uh, what we're doing with uh, Ukraine, it applies in many ways also to Georgia, but we're talking about Ukraine today, uh, is to say, what have we actually done in the last year or so? Uh, what have we not done? Uh, and what do we need to do? And so let me just frame it that way. Uh, the most important thing I think that we've done, uh, and I see a couple of friends in the audience who've commented to me about this, is change the way we talk about it, change the language. Because it's very important to get the language right so it reflects reality. And I'll give you an illustration. When I first sat down in the State Department was shown a map that had a colored area in the little right-hand side of Ukraine, and, and it had an acronym, and it said NGCA. And I had to think, the NGC, NGC, what's that? And it was explained to me, it's a non-government controlled area. And I thought, how far are we going to go to obscure Russia's responsibility for what's happening here? Um, <laughs> you have a Ukrainian controlled area and a Russian controlled area. Just say it. Uh, so that was one of the first things that we've done, is to actually be very clear about the situation. And, and let me give you a couple of illustrations of that. One is the humanitarian aspects of this. There, this is a shockingly big and important humanitarian catastrophe that no one talks about. Uh, we have over 10,000 people killed. That is more people killed in a war in Europe since the wars in the Balkans, which caused NATO to intervene in both Bosnia and Kosovo. We have over a million and a half displaced persons. That is more people displaced by a war in Europe since World War II. We have a population in the Donbass that is roughly about half of what it was before the war started. That's a, that's a massive depopulation. For those people who remain, the humanitarian situation is terrible. Uh, you have everything from physical threats of you know, unexploded ordnance, landmines, mortar fire, sniper fire. You have severe restrictions on freedom of movement. You have food insecurity affecting about a million people. You have threats to clean water supply. You have severe environmental degradation. You have a collapse of the economy. You have periodic shutoffs in services, for instance, on cell phones, which are tremendously important for people to be able to communicate. Uh, and when you think about the population mix that's left behind, it is largely the elderly. Uh, it, young men don't want to be there because they don't want to be pressed into military service. Young women don't want to be there for their own safety and also to have employment. Most people who left the Donbass went west. Some went to Russia as well. Uh, some went to Belarus, but the majority went west. And those people left behind are the elderly who are more challenged in moving and finding employment elsewhere and also trying to hold down the property. So I think it's just important to lay out just what kind of humanitarian uh, impact this war has had. And then the direct corollary to that is this is only happening because Russia has invaded and occupied this territory. Russia has 100% command and control of the military forces in uh, the occupied Donbass. Uh, they have Russian generals in charge, Russian officers at every level of the chain of command. They pay for the contract soldiers that fill out the force, and they direct the military forces. And likewise, they have command and control of the two political entities they established to shield Russia's responsibility. Uh, these are the so-called people's republics. Uh, so 
getting the language right and helping people understand exactly what's happening here I think is important. The second thing we've done is we've tried to increase the pressure we're putting on Russia in order to, to get them to negotiate towards a solution. Uh, that includes keeping sanctions in place in the U.S. and increasing those sanctions periodically over time. And that's a track that we have been on uh, during the course of the Trump administration and will continue to be on. And you'll, you'll see additional sanctions come into play every month or two months or so as we've seen. Likewise, we've worked very closely with our European allies and the Europeans have kept sanctions in place as well. And I think this is somewhat surprising to Russia perhaps, but the European Union has shown tremendous resilience and strength in keeping these in place. Uh, we have lifted the arms embargo on Ukraine. This was something where it was seen a few years ago as potentially provocative to help Ukraine defend itself. And uh, we got rid of that. We have now uh, helped Ukraine with anti-tank weapons, with anti-sniper systems. And the decision from the administration is to treat Ukraine like a normal country, a country that has a right to self-defense, a country that has a national security strategy, a country that may have gaps in that strategy, and friends and allies can talk about how to help fill those gaps. And, uh, we have, working through the Congress, a new package of foreign military financing, and we'll be sitting down with the Ukrainians to talk possibly also about foreign military sales and what would make sense for them. Uh, this isn't about ramping up the war. This is about deterring further aggression and making sure that Ukraine has as capable and professional a military as possible. Uh, I can say with great confidence, having met with everyone, Ukrainians have no illusions about retaking the territory that they've lost by force. Uh, that would be a catastrophe for Ukraine to attempt that. Uh, but it is important that any further aggression be deterred and that Ukraine build the capacities and strength so that it can continue to emerge successfully as a, as a healthy, Euro secure European democracy. Uh, another thing that we've done as we've, we've, uh, is to um, put in place a uh, firm U.S. government policy, a declaration, the Pompeo Declaration, that we will not recognize Russia's uh, claimed annexation of Crimea. This is similar to what was done concerning the Baltic states in, the 19, in 1940, and we wanted to be sure that we had a firm policy in place on that as well. And finally, we've done all of these things in very, very close coordination with our uh, partners in Europe, our allies, France and Germany in particular, because they run the Normandy process, but also working with other members of the EU and NATO, uh, Canada in particular, UK in particular, Sweden. So this is a very unified transatlantic effort in putting in place the right positioning for us. So I think that, that covers the ground of what we did. Uh, what did we not do? Uh, we did not impact the decision making from President Putin and others in Russia about whether to continue the war. Uh, they are determined to continue to do so and my estimation is that the chances of their changing their position now are lower than they were even a year ago. I think that Russia has essentially decided to wait out the Ukrainian election, see what happens, maybe there'll be new opportunities that arise to get a more favorable position for Russia, so I think they intend to just play it out. Uh, that's unfortunate because, as I said, that is directly causing the humanitarian hardships uh, that I referenced. Uh, it is sad and ironic that Russia claims that a major part of its position is to protect Russian-speaking people in Ukraine, when in fact its very actions and policies are the only thing that is hurting Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. Uh, Finally, the way ahead. Uh, I think we need to keep on track. Uh, I, I believe that sanctions do have an impact and we see evidence of that in Russia. I believe that having a strong position and some resilience and stamina over time is what's necessary to convince Russia that it's not going to get better for them and potentially can get worse. Ultimately, the Russian goal, I, I believe, is to see Ukraine flip back to being a, a, a satellite or a part of Russia's greater civilization as Russia sees it. I think Russia has already lost that. Uh, the uh, U Ukrainian people have fundamentally altered their views about Russia and about their country and about the West. You now have a Ukraine that is more unified, more nationalist, more pro-EU and NATO, and more Russia skeptic than ever existed in history. 
And that trend is continuing as long as Russia continues to occupy this territory and kill Ukrainians. Uh, so I don't see this turning around. Uh, as long as we can keep a strong position in place to demonstrate that as long as this continues, Russia's position will not improve, that could then be an opportunity to talk with Russia about how do we then wind down this war. We don't want to see this war continue. Um, and then um, finally, I think the, um, the big picture aim here is to make sure that Ukraine is successful as a European market democracy. It has a ways to go. Uh, it has done great work, especially in the last four years. Ukraine has done more on reform, on strengthening the economy, on fighting corruption than had been done in the preceding 20 years. At the same time, there's a lot that is not done. And I think we need to be working closely with our Ukrainian friends, also with the EU and the IMF, to be as ambitious as possible in trying to help Ukraine reform its economy, fight corruption, restructure its economy away from so much ownership being in the hands of just a few people, uh, and building a much more resilient, stable, prosperous, and secure country for the future. So that's where we are. Uh, I'm happy to join the Q&A. So thank you.